Kiam and of course, you know, a little introduction is necessary, although, you know, for people from the community, maybe not so much. But then actually, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know, Marcus, if you're aware, today is Schrodinger's birthday. Uh, yes. No, I didn't. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, yeah, I, um, I think somebody is. Has to to our guru. Okay. Yeah, no issues. So today is actually um, Schrodinger's birth anniversary. And uh, he, of course, also is from Vienna, which was yes. completely unplanned. But we have, uh, I mean, I, I would say, you know, somebody who would probably be equally famous, if not, uh, you know, at least close to that uh, as our speaker today. So I'm feeling very positive about today's colloquium being by Marcus Arndt, who is a full professor of quantum nanophysics at the University of Vienna. And his research focuses on uh, foundations and applications of matter wave interferometry to explore quantum physics at the interface to the classical world, to chemistry, biomolecular physics, mass spectroscopy, and optomechanics. Um, we don't usually hear all these topics in one particular person's repertoire, so it's actually fascinating. So together with his group, um, you know, they have developed new molecular beam sources, detectors, interferometer techniques to explore quantum delocalization and decoherence for molecules, clusters, and nanoparticles. Uh, I will not, uh, he, I think he has some 40 page CV. So the idea would be to just, you know, name one or two awards, which include among others, the, Aust uh, the Austrian FWF start and the, and now here comes the pronunciation, but you can't blame me. It's Wittgenstein Prize mm -hmm. and uh, an ERC advance grant, the DPG Robert Richard Pohl Prize and the Schrodinger Prize by the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So I think that is the one which also we should end with the award part because you, we can also celebrate uh, Schrodinger's birth anniversary. So with that, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't think we should uh, spend too much time on the introduction, go straight to the talk. Uh, universal matter wave interferometry, quantum classical interface and on biomolecular <clears throat> technology. Marcus. Thank you very much. So I'm really happy to be, well, at least virtually with you. <laughs> uh, and I hope that really soon again, we can, can meet in person. But uh, so I, actually, I ignored entirely that it was Schrödinger's birthday, but uh, I passed by his home every day huh? because it's close to, actually, you will see that on the next slide. That's the Stuhlhofstiege. And just opposite of that little staircase, his home actually was. And so I pass by that place every day, make my <laughs> reverences and, <laughs> and go on to, to the university. So I just want to introduce um, my group, of course, not everybody now, and they're also uh, interns of this summer and previous co-workers. So it's a, it's a big team because we have many topics that we try to cover. And uh, it has developed over the years, actually 20 years, meanwhile. And um, so there's a lot to tell, and I cannot talk about um, everything, so I will skip the optomechanics part today, uh, even though there's, that's also an important and interesting part. Um, now, the, um, oops, um, since she asked me to, to uh, be a bit more general in the beginning, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. No, it's to just say. great, because we do have a diverse audience, so yeah, yeah please. So let, let me just um, briefly, now focus on why we do this huh? and why um, also when I when I talk to our students um, every year and every every summer, the question is why why is it what we're doing huh? and why is quantum physics on the one hand important and why on the other hand is it so kind of strange still. Huh? And um, then I typically try to emphasize that well, we are using quantum mechanics every day. I mean, I don't go to the doctor every day, but if you do and if you go to magnetic re resonance imaging then you have a system that uses something that does not exist classically, the spin. Um, if you go to positron emission tomography, you even use antimatter, to, which is a quantum thing, so to say it didn't exist before Dirac, well, it always existed, but wasn't known before quantum mechanics, before the Dirac equation. So um, even in medicine, people are using quantum things, um, not necessarily superpositions and entanglement, but still quantum things. Same in storage media. Um, magnetism by itself is of course related to spin, but uh, what people usually forget is that even the flash memory is using quantum tunneling to load and unload the electrons on these little islands. So we use quantum effects every minute almost. Um, lasers explicitly exploit quantum statistics, it's a Bose gas, uh, and of course it's very important to mention uh, Bose here. <laughs> uh, and 
Um, so we use that again every day. Um, the photo effect, the quantum optics effect par excellence, so to say, because Einstein received his Nobel Prize for that, um, is being used in yeah, light harvesting in CCD cameras, which everybody of us has in their pockets with their mobile phones. Um, but even the sun is using quantum mechanics all the time because you need tunneling uh, in order to do nuclear fusion. So it's really everywhere, everywhere. And well, a little bit less common, maybe you would say quantum transport, superconductivity um, that always requires cold environments. But again, going back to the magnetic resonance imaging machines, they often use magnetic superconducting magnets and cryogenics to run the the magnetic environment. So quantum transport is also very important there. And last but not least, um, that, that's still an entirely yeah, open field, um, what quantum effects you might have in biology. But um, tunneling is pretty ubiquitous, uh, electron tunneling, proton tunneling in your body all the day. And the light harvesting, electron um, the excitation, delocalization, and things like that. So we have it around us all the time. But uh, so we could be happy and say everything's fine, quantum mechanics is nice. So, so but why, why are we bothering about this anyhow and still? Because quantum mechanics is also, even the wave nature of quantum mechanics has been known by now for almost 100 years. So why still bother? And so here I made a lot, small list, it's, it's incomplete, but it relates to our experiments also of what we see in our everyday world and what we see in our quantum experiments, um, it's probably a mistake to say this is the world, the quantum world, because it it seems to generate the association or the, the, the image that um, there would be two different worlds, which probably they're not. It's probably just a quantum world, which we experience as a classical world under some circumstances. And the question is why? Why don't we see the quantum features that we discover in the experiments? Why don't we see them in everyday life? So, and what is it that is so special about quantum physics? Well, actually the word quantum mechanics comes from the discreteness, so to say, from the Latin word, how many, how much, you know, the, like the quantum of solace in James Bond is a small piece of solace. <laughs> and um, so it's the discreteness of the world that wasn't really appreciated before um, the turn of the last century. And Still, when Ludwig Boltzmann, who also taught here at the University of Vienna, when he discussed the atomic nature of nature, <laughs> uh, kinetic gas theory, he was really not loved very much for that. And nowadays it's common knowledge. But um, the discreteness of nature, that was something pretty out of the extraordinary in these days. And nowadays we use that for clocks, because you need uh, the quantum jumps between energy levels, which you need for navigation, for timekeeping. Um, for gravity measurements, even nowadays, you need it in spectroscopy, in chemistry, pharmacy, medicine, uh, in what well, to discover blood or DNA on crime sites, whatever. So we use it all the day, even though uh, I'm not in, in, in medicine or so. But um, the next thing is this distinguishability versus indistinguishability. And that is really something that we will also see in our matter waves, um, that things become so elementary when you go to very, very small systems that, that they just do not have any identity anymore, that they really have the same quantum numbers and cannot be distinguished even in principle. That gives rise to many fundamental effects, in particular then also to superposition states or entanglement. And that is, of course, very different from what you experience in our classical world. You would say, well, you can distinguish Peter from Fred, from, from, from Anna, and, um, and because they have so many different properties. But uh, if the systems get very elementary, you cannot distinguish them anymore. And if, if you cannot even distinguish their location or momentum anymore, and uh, we have tricks how to do this, then they lose um, actually the meaning of position and momentum under some circumstances. <clears throat> so that is something that we need in matter wave physics, that we need for superfluids, for superconductors, lasers, and Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, but in everyday life, we don't see that. Also in everyday life, of course, we have um, sometimes luck or not. So there's chance, subjective chance, if I see someone on the street um, and 
well, didn't really expect to see him there, um, I would say, well, that's a lucky coincidence. Uh, it's by chance that I met him. But um, a demon from the outside could have seen that I left my house, other people, the, the other person left um, their house, and it was kind of predictable that we would meet. In quantum mechanics, that's no longer true. There's objective randomness where we cannot even in principle tell which measurement outcome we will find only with a certain probability distribution. The statistical character of that theory, that is kind of um, probably a head scratching part of quantum mechanics, that there's a fundamental indeterminacy in, in that theory. And uh, we need that, of course, also for quantum random number generators and uh, key distribution, for instance. And well, the issue about locality, non-locality, which is very famous in Bell experiments, um, but actually that's also kind of an agent in metaweight physics, that, that there's more information that you could classically gather somehow. That is a weird thing that we only find in quantum experiments. And the question is, why don't we see that in our everyday life? So the question is not why is quantum mechanics so weird, but why are we so normal, really? And um, so again, a short reminder of, so all, all these things can be exemplified in, um, in matter wave physics. And um, so what, what are matter waves? What is the wave nature of things? And we typically see the wave nature of things in interference experiments. And well, the wave nature of water, that's something very simple. Huh? Uh, you make plane waves just by dipping um, a ruler into, the, in, into your bathtub and put two slits in, in the way and you will see interference. That's no major mystery. This is kind of what you teach in undergraduate physics or even in high school physics that you will see diffraction and interference, the amplification or cancellation of waves. But there the waves are in water and sound. These waves are made up of many, many atoms and you can always imagine it as well, uh, the lack of atoms being filled by more atoms. And this is no longer true if we go to the quantum wave nature and the superposition of that. <clears throat> where we're interested, for instance, in the physics of light or the physics of matter. And well, that's an experiment that you can do for three euros or so, or three dollars, essentially, um, that you take. Well, I, I, I've seen that at the railway station, they sell for one euro. Um, little laser pointers and if you take any small grating that you can even find in nature um, you can do your own diffraction experiments of course typically with a laser pointer that you buy at the railway station and uh, and um, and and with the screen that you have you do not see the single photon character of it but if you dilute it if you if you attenuate the laser beam more and more and more and if you had a sufficiently sensitive detector in principle your eye is sensitive enough but more professionally nowadays you would take a CCD camera, um, then you really see that this interference pattern, um, the wave nature of light is also constructed if you shoot at the photons in this case one by one essentially. And that was a very famous experiment by Taylor in 1908, I think. So even this has been known, known, known now for more than 100 years that you can have wave effects for single particles, single photons that are detected one by one. And um, well, actually, this was a big mystery in, in at the beginning of the last century and actually inspiring Louis de Broglie's reasoning about the matter wave nature of matter, of things. But um, let's first see why photons should also be particle-like to some extent. Um, well, what is a particle at all? It's something that has a position that has a momentum. Um, obviously, we cannot feel the shape of a photon. Sometimes uh, I ask my students, what is the size of a photon? And you can get very different answers. And well, my answer is the photon size depends on what measurement you do. It can be as big as from here to the moon. If you do a, met a photon ex interference experiment with extremely coherent light and coherence lengths nowadays in the lab can be a few hundred thousand kilometers, um, then the photon is kind of delocalized by that distance, if you wish. But in the act of measurement, it's just there more or less instantaneously. At least we cannot tell how quickly this is. Um, and so it really depends on the experiment. But the energy transfer and the momentum transfer you see in 
uh, light harvesting in photovoltaics, but also in laser cooling when a single photon gives a momentum, a kick to the atom. So photons have obviously both um, particle and light nat uh, and wave nature and um, matter the same. So this is something that Louis de Broglie did not yet know. And this is actually in the scanning tunneling microscope image that we took 10 years ago in my lab. Um, but many, many groups, of course, have taken these images of um, surface reconstructed silicon 1117 by 7, where each individual dot that you see on the screen is a single individual atom. So you can see the discreteness of matter, if you would. And um, you can also place molecules on top and also see them one by one. So what you see is little humps here. These are individual fullerene molecules. So obviously the molecule is localized here in these experiments to, well, you can localize it to better than an angstrom, but the size of the molecule is roughly seven angstroms in diameter. Um, if you even zoom in, well, we've tried this, but we didn't have enough cooling. But other experiments have shown that if you zoom in with an STM, you can even resolve the hexagonal and pentagonal nature of the partial rings in the fullerene if you suppress the rotation of the molecule. So obviously, matter is really composed of what you believe it nowadays to be composed of, of atoms with a well-defined structure. And this kind of ball stick model that you develop in chemistry really fits the imagination and the experiment very well to some degree. And they're localized dots in microscopy. So it's definitely particle-like, it's, it's nanometer sized or below. And if you take bigger molecules, proteins, you will find them bigger in these experiments. Now, um, as you know, the quantum mechanics um, started kind of with Max Planck on f December 14th, 1900, when Max Planck introduced um, the explanation for the thermal radiation, uh, for the character of thermal radiation, and he needed to introduce a quantization of the energy. You know? And that's what we nowadays uh, know as uh, the photo effect, uh, not photo effect, but as um, the energy quantization that the photon energy is H times nu, the frequency times Planck's constant, that is the energy of a photon. That was introduced in 1900. Only very shortly afterwards, Einstein introduced his special theory of relativity, and it's probably the most famous equation that you know that E equals mc squared, that there's an equivalence between energy and mass that they can transform into each other. And what he also, of course, um, elaborated upon was the Lorentz transformation, how different observers see positions and uh, times under different aspects, if they are in motion or not in motion. And when Louis de Broglie looked at that, um, well, he knew that there was this wave particle duality of light, and this was really a puzzle to him. And so he thought, well, light is something which has the speed of light, so it must be relativistic. And at the same time, it, it makes a click, so it has energy, maybe a mass. Well, actually, he believed it had a mass. Nowadays, we know at least to many, many digits that it doesn't. But um, Louis de Broglie still thought it was a, a massive particle. And therefore, in his works of 1923, you still find atoms of light in, in the description. You know? The photon for him was atoms of light. But um, what he did is combine the two theories, and not in the very naive form that we would do it here, just equating the two equations, uh, saying E equals H nu and E equals mc squared, but almost that. You know? He used also the Lorentz transformation in addition, but it's a three-line version, which every student in, um, in high school physics, so to say, could have derived. And that won him a Nobel Prize, if you wish. Um, and, and the message at the end is, well, for an observer for whom this portion of matter is in steady motion, well, he or she will constantly see the internal periodic phenomenon in phase with a wave. That's what he predicted in his 1923 Nature paper. And, and he was actually very bold because he said, by means of these new ideas, it will probably be possible to solve all, most all the problems brought up by quanta. And uh, well, you may wonder what, what were the problems really brought up by quanta? And it's, for instance, um, the quantization of the atom. Um, Niels Bohr had his um, uh, hypothesis, so to say, on the quantization of the angular momentum that was not really well understood. 
but with Louis de Broglie's um, yeah, idea of the matter wave, this could be explained. But he also predicted there should be diffraction, and he expected that to happen for electrons. Um, but of course, nowadays I would say, well, all problems brought up by quanta were brought up by Louis de Broglie essentially since then, because we still don't know what this wave really is. And um, well, since then, many people have worked on matter wave interferometry, and there was a huge kick off, so to say. Essentially, all essential particles were seen in this uh, as waves very early on. For electrons, as you know, Davis and Germer were uh, the first to see electron diffraction, but also Thomson and Reed, and Thomson and Davison received the Nobel Prize for that. The neutron was only discovered in 1932, and still already in 1936, the first wave nature aspects of the neutron were, were seen in Bragg diffraction. Um, Esteban and Stern were working very early on on these ideas. Actually, if you read the letters and, and early works of Otto Stern, he was very quickly inspired by de Broglie. And actually, I think before the electron wave nature was seen, he was working on atomic beams already, I, if I'm not mistaken now. But they had difficulties to see that. And still, in 1930, they could see for helium and uh, hydrogen too, so even for a diatomic molecule in reflection of a surface. And then it became quiet for larger and larger things. Um, for electrons and neutrons, the matter wave nature was exploited very heavily. Um, it became very useful and quickly useful in electron microscopy and neutron diffraction and analysis in solid state physics. Um, but for atoms and molecules, that was kind of a pause. And the reason for that was that it's so difficult to manipulate atoms and molecules or even bigger things to make them slow enough, to cool them enough, that the de Broglie wavelength would be long enough that you can really see the effects. Um, the 80s were kind of a golden era, and actually 1991 is kind of a annus mirabilis also for me, because so many interferometers were built in these days. And um, Dave Pritchard's name and uh, Mark Kasevich and Stephen Chu's name and Christian Bordet. So the, these are the heroes in the field at the very early, in the very early days and still up today, of course. <laughs> but uh, they were the pioneers. And, and uh, John Clauser was very early on on this, um, in, in this topic. But in 1995, um, the entire world turned around, so to say. Um, of course, they were still looking into meta waves, but they were mostly focusing on ultra cold atoms because Eric Connell, Carl Wyman, um, Wolfgang Kettele, they and their groups discovered them or realized for the first time was Einstein condensates and and this was kind of the focus of research of an entire community with by now probably more than 100 to 150 groups. And it's interesting to see that um, of course these are very macroscopic quantum objects um, with between thousands or sometimes a hundred and almost a billion atoms at ultra low temperatures nowadays between pico Kelvin and micro Kelvin, extremely weakly bound with nano electron volts binding energies. But whenever you do these experiments, it's essentially, if you do interference experiments with them, it's interference with single atoms, even though every, all the atoms do the same thing. It's a little bit like laser light when, when you do laser diffraction, laser interference, it's still the wavelength of a single photon that counts just that all the photons do the same thing. And so in 1999, Anton Seiling and myself, we, we started thinking about, well, how can, we, how can we shift and add to this field? And we started looking into um, macromolecule diffraction. And of course, it took a while to really take off. But um, well, actually, we started thinking about this already in 1997, but it took a while to set it up. And um, and so the first diffraction experiments with fullerene C60, C70, which I will briefly mention, were done in 1999. And since then, we've done it with a variety of molecules that we, you will see. Um, and the difference to the Bose-Einstein condensates is that there are probably equally many atoms, at least um, our biggest molecules and the smallest BCs have equally many atoms. But the temperature scale is off by 10 to 12 orders of magnitude, if you wish. The binding energy the same, 10 orders of magnitude in between. And because of that, the, um, the Broil wavelength is really that of the entire thing. The entire molecule delocalizes as a whole entity. Now, 
Um, so what does that really mean when I say this delocalizes as a whole entity? Well, the, the imagination or the image that we have is um, uh, kind of, well, De Broglie didn't really predict quantum soccer, but um, it, that's, that's the analogy to his diffraction ideas for electrons. So if you take a double slit, as you would do it in high school physics, you shoot a ball onto a, a brick wall in this case with a single gate open, you would see a certain distribution where the balls can land in, in the goal. And well, if you look very carefully, then you see already that um, this width here is, is broader than you would expect it given the narrow slit. So there's already some quantumness, otherwise it wouldn't work afterwards. Yeah? So here we need already single slit diffraction on Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, if you wish. That is small, a very good localization, small delta x gives rise to a large delta p, which translates into a large delta x in the goal. Um, but um, the, the strange thing now really is if you open the gate, I'm just repeating what you find sometimes in textbooks. Um, the strange thing is that if you open the second gate, places that were filled with balls before are now entirely void of balls. It's not that you add new fringes, it's that you remove material, so to say, by opening additional possibilities. And that is sometimes, um, well, sorry, there's still one German <laughs> phrase in there. Um, but there's, um, that's sometimes mistakenly described in textbooks. So it's, it's really the absence of probability if you open additional possibilities. That is, to me, the kind of mystery in this. Yeah? It indicates to us that there is kind of knowledge of each individual ball where to land. So to say the probability distribution has changed and the balls will always follow the probability distribution. So now this is just a picture. And uh, the question is, can this even be done? And I tried that also um, with my kids when I was still young. I know they're grown up and wouldn't do that anymore. But um, we also tried that on the football field. Uh, on the football field, it doesn't work. Yeah? Um, so that was a test that kind of failed, but it expectedly failed. Yeah? But um, if, you, if you do it in the lab with smaller soccer balls, what happens then? Huh? That's where the theater starts. And um, the simple naive setup is you need to prepare plane waves, like in textbook physics. You need to introduce a diffraction grating, shoot something through it, and this something is the smallest ball in the world. It's a carbon-60 molecule, only 0.7 nanometers in diameter, so roughly 200 million times smaller than a real FIFA ball. And when you shoot this through a real experiment, you find a real interference pattern. The diffraction grating was, of course, much smaller, was only 100 nanometers, but um, you see a real diffraction pattern. And uh, just to give credit also to the early pioneers here, you see also Anton Seilinger and uh, Olaf Nayers and Freyron van der Sau and Julian Voss andre who is now an artist in uh, Portland and uh, really a famous artisan, Claudia. Keller, who is now at Infinia. And um, so um, we repeated, just to illustrate that a bit more clearly, we repeated that later um, with dye molecules just to make it more visual and also to see the Heisenberg's principle a little bit better at work. And for that, we coated molecules, dye molecules like this phthalocyanin on the inside of a vacuum window illuminate the vacuum window from the outside with a blue laser that is focused through an objective to roughly 1.4 micrometers in diameter. And this very tiny localization of the laser beam of 1.4 micrometers that is enough to tell the molecule, well, your origin is delta x, so your momentum uncertainty must be delta p. And this delta p, as, a, as, it, as the molecule evolves along the beam line here, which is about a meter or so, a meter 20, then um, the momentum transfers into a delocalized position and it's sufficiently delocalized to cover several of the slits in the nanomechanical grating, which in this case here is a silicon nitride grating made by Uri Chesnovsky and friends in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and uh, it had 100 nanometers period and 50 nanometer openings. So it's actually not so much different. The diameter is 1.4 nanometers and the thickness of the grating was only 10. So it's pretty much comparable. 
But nonetheless, the, the molecules get diffracted, and what you see at the screen, where they land, stick, and can be imaged in fluorescence, um, you see this fluorescence image, which is kind of the interference pattern as a function of velocity, if you wish. It's as a function of velocity because in the gravitational field, the slower molecules have more time to fall, so they land lower on the screen. And because they are slower, they have a longer de Broglie wavelength and therefore make a wide, more widely separated interference pattern. So that is kind of the intuition behind it. And so that's nice to see, but of course it's, um, it's, it's limited for various reasons. One is the interaction between the molecule and the gratings. Van der Waals forces really become extremely relevant. So we tried to make the gratings thinner and thinner and thinner until a single atomic layer was left, a single layer of graphene. And again, our friends in Tel Aviv wrote little gratings into that graphene layer, and still we could see interference. So we see, so even though that the, the de Broglie wavelength is only given by the mass of the molecule, and nothing of the internal state enters, the interaction with the walls is nonetheless relevant. Okay, but if you want to push this to higher masses to make it more universal, um, we need something else. And the idea originally goes back, well, I, I think, well, it, it was known in photonics for two, two centuries, by now, 18, um, 1836, I think. Um, but John Clauser also suggested to use that, and he was the first to use that for atoms, and to use that potentially for bigger things. And um, we have a variation of that theme in the Kapitze Dirac Tabula interferometer, um, which works as follows. So, Preparing a, a plane wave of matter is extremely difficult um, because, well, they really start out as particles, as you've seen. So if they're sitting on a surface, they're really localized particles. They have no idea of delocalizing by micrometers or so. So you have to do something to them in order to convince them to get delocalized. And this something is Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. So you push them through a grating here you send them through vacuum, through a grating, and then they delocalize because of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And then they encounter a grating which is not material but optical. And this optical grating um, imprints phases, and the phase evolution leads to an interference pattern at the end of the screen, so to say. But the screen is not a screen, but a grating that is scanned across the pattern to see the interference. We count the molecules in some kind of mass spectrometer here, it's a quarter pole mass spectrometer. And that gives rise to interference patterns that you will see in a minute, but um, just to say, well, we've really done this on a large variety of different things. Fullerenes were one, vitamins, tailored molecules, polypeptides, um, polyaromatic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, alkali atoms, alkaline earth atoms, so a large variety of different things. So this kind of trick works for a pretty universal class of things. No, but it was still a um, compact interferometer of 20 um, centimeters in total length, which we had recently over the last year stretched by a factor of 10, which we therefore call the long baseline universal matter wave interferometer. And some of the young heroes working on that, um, Jakob Feind did his PhD um, on that experiment are shown here. And again, this interferometer is really universal in the sense that we had all these things in that interferometer. The same setup can be used for all these atoms, for molecules, for tripeptides, up to macromolecules that we will see in a minute. The de design specification is actually for de Broglie wavelengths as short as 50 femtometers. That's only 10 times roughly um, a larger nucleus, so to say, maybe 20 times. And even for masses as high as roughly 30,000 mass units, we see that already. And, um, and this is due to the fact that there's a long evolution time for the wave function and the gratings are very tiny. These are 266 nanometer period gratings in this place, that place, this place. And actually in the middle grating, we can choose between material and optical phase gratings. The optical phase grating would be a standing laser light wave again producing a grating at 266 nanometers. Now, this is extremely fragile and critical to align and requires very good ultra vacuum. And um, it's sitting on an inva bar of 160 kilograms to be well massive and isolated from the spring suspension system with eddy current damping and Teflon balls and springs and whatever. 
So it's extremely well isolated from the environment. Um, and that is really needed for these things. Um, in that system, we have, that's kind of, this is really our mass record so far. We've seen the delocalized quantum wave nature of this guy here. Well, this is just a prototypical representative of it because it's an entire family of molecules. Um, these are perfluoroalkyl functionalized oligoporphyrins. Um, they're actually four porphyrins in the center and each of them has many contact points to which these alkyl chains are connected. Um, so they're typically composed of anywhere between 1,800 to 2,000 atoms, um, are massive between 25,000 and 28,000 mass units. Um, the composition shown here is just a prototypical one. They all are a little bit different. They're traveling at really high speeds. That's the speed of an airliner. Hmm? Airbus, I don't know, A320 or so in, in free flight would have roughly that velocity. The molecular diameter is five nanometers. Um, of course, they're shaking, they're rotating, they're vibrating at, yeah, with some picosecond um, vibrational uh, oscillation periods and nanosecond structural reshaping times, um, rotation periods of well, gigahertz, a bit more than that. And there are literally billions of structural isomers. Not, well, no two molecules are really in the same quantum state. So you could say, well, why can it work at all? Why, why can we see quantum interference if they're all distinguishable? Well, the trick is that, um, well, the different molecules are distinguishable, but the path for each individual molecule through the, through the experiment, that is indistinguishable. It has various paths to choose from, and it takes all of them at the same time, if one can interpret that so literally. But at least that's what the wave function does. No? After that, it's a matter of interpretation what the molecule really does, but the wave function really is delocalized. And so you expect to see some interference, and um, well, I go back to, to this, and you see the interference pattern on the screen. That's really a measured, that's measured data. And from that, you can extract the fringe visibility, and the fringe visibility can be plotted as, for instance, a function of the velocity of the molecules as a function of the diffraction laser power. Somehow you have to vary something to make sure that you understand what's going on and that you can distinguish that from just classical moiré images, which might also occur. And the, the black dots here are the quantum mechanical measurements. The blue curve is what you expect quantum mechanically. The red curve is what you would expect classically. And it's pretty much distinct. You know? So it's, it's, and on the other hand, the quantum experiment agrees, or the experiment agrees well with the quantum theoretical prediction. So we were happy to see that. Um, and just to mention, well, I consider that also to be a Schrödinger cat, and that's maybe for a debate afterwards. But it's a Schrödinger cat to me is something, a macroscopic thing, like a cat being in two possible states, dead and alive. In our case, it's molecule here and there. But our molecule is also complex and macroscopic. It's in two clearly distinct states. It's actually even much hotter than a cat would be. And it also contains a biomolecule because the porphyrins are what gives the color to blood. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of, well, the superposition or cat state, if you wish. You may even write it down as an entangled state. Uh, people usually don't do this. I don't overemphasize it, but it's nonetheless an interesting thing to think about um, that you can also write it down as a noon state. But it's a noon state between the molecule, the number of atoms on each side and the vacuum. And because it's the vacuum, people usually don't like it so much, no? which I understand. <laughs> but nonetheless, you can write it down that way. Now, why is that interesting? Uh, first, because well, it's kind of surprising that it works. And second, because it helps us approaching and pushing the limits in tests of interferometric tests of con continuous spontaneous localization. Um, so that is a model that was put forward by Girardi, Rimini, and Weber, Pearl, and nowadays very strongly by Angelo Bassi in Trieste, um, where the idea is that you may modify the Schrödinger equation by a nonlinear term, an ad hoc collapse term that would shrink a wave function ever so rarely for tiny things, but very often for big things. And it would shrink it, well, we don't know to what size, but people then usually start assuming it's around 100 nanometers. Because if it's much smaller, it would violate energy conservation very quickly. 
And if it's much bigger, it's not very meaningful. So, um, <clears throat> and we would have seen it. So the question is, is there any such collapse? And well, so far the answer is no. No one has ever seen this spontaneous collapse, but if it were to happen, it would do it with m squared. It would do it quadratically more probable uh, with increasing mass. So if we can go from uh, an atom to 2,000 atoms, that's already uh, 4 million times more probable to occur. And if we can go from our current, say, 10 to the 4 mass units to 10 to the 8, this would be um, even 10 to the 8 times more probable. So um, we've, we've used that to, to set some interferometric boundaries to what is published in the lit literature. Of course, there are non-interferometric bounds also, which are more stringent, but not based on quantum experiments, uh, rather on the absence of heating, on the absence of radiation coming out of kind of literally nowhere. Um, but that's still an open field of research. Yeah? But uh, we're contributing there with interferometric results. And yeah, probably I'll skip this one, uh, the macroscopicity part, uh, and come back to that if somebody's interested. Um, so, of course, 10,000 or 20,000 mass units, that's, that was even kind of impressive to ourselves because uh, the molecules are very hot and they could radiate thermal radiation and they just barely don't do it. So it's, it's really at the edge of what we could do. Um, and the question is, how can one produce, uh, proceed? We're currently working on an experiment that's based on cold clusters. And, um, well, actually, the exact material, I, I do not want to disclose here because it's still a uh, work in progress, it's still changing. But you can see that we were considering it looks so golden, we were thinking about gold, we were thinking about cesium, we're still playing with different materials, but that's the nice thing about the setup, it can really work with different materials. And um, so we were very early on, already 10 years ago, inspired by Haberland and from Isendorf um, to think about, well, actually, I met them at a conference and um, we came to a discussion and then we thought, I thought that it's um, a good idea to start looking into clusters. It's just a little bit harder than we thought 10 years ago. Um, we are more optimistic now. And um, you can aggregate big things with almost arbitrary composition. And these clusters are photoionizable, so you can make optical depletion gratings. So without going into the details here, because it's still work in progress, that's what we hope to push for 10 to the 6 atomic mass units. And there are chances that this can also be pushed to 10 to the 8. But uh, still, much work has to be invested and unfortunately also much money. But we are, we are on it. <clears throat> But so the, the high mass route is one thing. Um, but now you can also ask yourself, well, the thing that we have in the quantum superposition there already, this oligoporphyrin, this is as massive as green fluorescent proteins, exactly the same mass class. It's an organic molecule, 27,000 mass units. So why not do it with proteins themselves or later with viruses? And um, this is an interesting question, and we try to approach it bottom up. Um, and well, there's a long history to the interferometer that we have here, but I will just focus on, on the peptide stuff. Oops, now my screen disappeared. Uh, let's see if it's just mine. Um, Sorry, we can see your screen, Marcus. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Then it's just my, <laughs> yeah. I, I will just speak in the dark. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> I know where it is. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so the um, okay, coming back. The <clears throat> the interferometer that we have there is, is again a three grating interferometer. And without going into the details, the simple idea is that you can remove clusters of molecules, molecules, nanoparticles from the beam by photoionizing them or by photofragmenting them um, in the antinodes of a standing light wave. So you can we prepare a grating like a nanomechanical grating without the drawbacks of a nanomechanical grating, so without any Van der Waals forces. And um, this can also be switched, can be in the time domain, so that also has some advantages. And that was realized already a few years ago uh, with Philip Haslinger as the PhD student in these days. Um, and we did that for anthracene, vanilline, caffeine, uh, a variety of different molecules. But um, 
Um, one can actually also do it for polypeptides. And here you can see one antibiotic polypeptide, which is gramicidin A1. It's not super massive. It's on only 1800 atomic mass units massive, only 15 amino acids inside. But still, it's a pretty complex structure. And the, the, really the challenge in this field is to volatilize these molecules without destroying them. Proteins usually don't, don't like to fly. If you put them in a pan and try to fry them, they just denature or fragment. So the question is, what can you do? And the trick is not to heat them slowly, but to heat them super fast. Super fast here really meaning uh, within 300 femtoseconds and with terawatts per square centimeter intensity. So huge, huge intensities, but for a very short time. And then you launch these peptides into well, the vacuum and they're immediately captured or entrained by a cold gas, in this case of an argon atom, which cools them down very quickly, sufficiently quickly that they stay alive, not really alive, but still intact. And because of, well, this guy here, the tryptophan, this can be photoionized by 157 nanometers. None of all 20 amino acids can be photoionized by a single photon, but tryptophan can. And since we have three of them here, this molecule can be photoionized. And therefore, we can make these photodepletion gratings. And um, again, without going into the details, the fact that we see these little fringes here in agreement with the model in red and blue. Um, that tells you that this really also delocalizes not tremendously far, only here by 80 nanometers, but still a multiple of the own diameter of the molecule. If we now want to push this, we are trying to work um, with bigger things like insulin, ubiquitin, cytochrome, myoglobin, hemoglobin, bovine serum, albumin, things like that. Um, and well, laser desorption is one thing that one can do. Another option is to do electrospray. And we have that experiment as well. We know how to, we have electrosprayed insulin, for instance, charge reduced it. But then you need also to control its charge. In the end, we need neutral molecules for that experiment. And thanks to a collaboration also with chemists in Basel, Marcel Mayer and Valentin Köhler, uh, we now have photocleatable tags connected to these molecules. Um, that looks a bit weird here, hmm? these photocleavable tags that you can connect to insulin. And if you shine laser light onto them, this charge group goes off. So you can control the charge state of that molecule. And uh, doing this, we can neutralize insulin. So that's the first step towards um, also doing interference experiments with insulin and bigger proteins, but still much development to be done. So, and I think I have almost to conclude, but um, so why are we interested in, in this kind of universal interferometry? Um, I mean, demonstrating just the quantumness of big massive things, you could say, uh, isn't it good enough to do it either with silicon or with metal, with gold, with, or if you wish with a protein, why with all these different things? And the reason for that is that uh, first they have all different couplings to the environment. So the decoherence channels are very different. And second, once you do this, once you have set up this experiment, which is so sensitive to all perturbations, you can exploit these, um, these perturbations. So you can actually use that as a very sensitive force measurement. Currently, we are measuring forces as small as 10 to the minus 26 Newton. The next generation, um, well, over next generation will probably go beyond 10 to the, or below 10 to the minus 30 Newtons. So this can be extremely sensitive. And once you have such a sensitive force measurement, just from the shift of the interference fringe in external fields, be it electrical, magnetic, optical, collision interactions, um, any shift or perturbation of the fringes will tell you something about the structure of the particle in superposition, even though the Broyle interference itself is only determined by the mass of the particle. So, just to give an example here, there's the electrical polarizability of the particle that you send through. If you have a field gradient, an E gradient E field, which is homogeneous, um, oops, sorry, then um, the susceptibility or polarizability of the particle can be measured just by increasing the electric field and monitoring the shift of the fringe. And we've done this for a variety of different molecules, for vitamins, for fullerenes. Um, it sets new bounds on fullerene numbers. Um, well, in atom 
interferometry, you are no, you're, you're accustomed to measuring things with 10 digits precision. For molecular physics, that's not the case, simply because the molecular properties are not so well defined. It's not our imprecision in measurements, but the molecular properties are usually not much better defined than on the percent level um, if they're not ultra cold and in a very well defined conformal. <clears throat> but here we could already set new measurements for the fullerenes, for some vitamins and peptides. Um, again, I'll skip the details. This is just to give you the flavor of um, what we can measure. It's polarizabilities. Actually, there's an entire list of what we've measured in the past, like optical polarizabilities, dynamical polarizabilities, permanent and new staple moments, um, magnetic moments, static, uh, yeah, mostly static magnetic moments um, and susceptibilities, but you get even structural information about the molecule um, because depending on the structure, the magnetic and electronic response will change. And I think what will become really important in the long run, it's still hard work to be done, to be honest, um, but spectroscopy on the single photon level, single photon, single molecule spectroscopy in free flight um, that can be done. First demonstration have been shown, and so we have shown this in 2014. Um, but a full spectrum really takes quite a while, and we need to improve our source and spectroscopy methods now. Well, um, just to summarize, maybe here. Um, <clears throat> so our, our focus and interest is anything in mesoscopic matter wave physics, and. So we've done this in a variety of different molecular interferometers um, with atoms, with hot and complex molecules, with even clusters of molecules like vanillin clusters in superposition as an entire cluster, uh, with antibiotics like uh, the gramicidin, with vitamins, well, the polypeptide was the antibiotic, actually neurotransmitters also. Um, we're working towards proteins. Um, it shouldn't be impossible, actually you'll be are planning and working towards also doing this with virals and viruses. Large metal clusters, there the sources are much better defined and much more intense. Silicon nanoparticles is another experiment where we use optomechanics and uh, can certainly profit from the expertise also in-house with Markus Aspelmeyer and friends and Nikolai Kiesel, and um, where they developed quite a bit of, um, in particular, the ground state cooling of silicon dioxide nanoparticles in traps. And um, so why is this interesting? Because we can test fundamental physics, the quantum classical interface, um, probe really some physical chemistry in the sense of yeah, chemical molecular properties, also biomolecular properties. Along that line, we have to develop quite a bit of molecular beam methods, quantum detectors. I didn't have the time to talk about nanowire detectors that we're nowadays using for protein detection. Um, there are cooling techniques on all scales that we need. Uh, question is, can we do also protein cooling to the micro Kelvin level in the end? And there might be actually new physics that scales, well, that can be probed with particles that scale with mass, so that m squared probable physics can be probed. And um, so that's really the last one, just to give nice pictures. Um, so already now we're at a mass range of currently 30,000 mass units, roughly a little bit below. Um, but a range, a large range of proteins is anywhere between six and 100,000 mass units. A particularly interesting candidate would be cryptochrome because that's at the same time the guy who's suspected to be responsible for the avian compass, so for the navigation of birds in magnetic fields. Um, so the question is, can we do a single photon recall spectroscopy and magnetometry on individual such proteins in free flight? Um, and I hope we will get there. Um, we are working towards massive cluster interferometry. Um, there we still say hafnium, but in the meantime, that has changed. So there's a variety of different clusters that will probably be a different metal. Um, and that's in, again interesting because it tests macroscopicity, the quantum classical interface. Jess Riel always suggested that we should be sensitive to light dark matter in a special mass range. Um, and I'm also still intrigued by the fact that the mass range we're interested in, so 100,000 Dalton, is really what the next generation of experiments can do. And um, viroids, which is different from viruses, so it's only RNA chains, um, they are 
actually in that Mars region. So it should be possible to get closer to the interface to the living world. And um, well, silicon nanoparticles is on the agenda. We're working on the cooling of that. And yeah, but to have very intense sources of single nanoparticles, that is still a challenge. And again, we're working on that, and many colleagues worldwide are working on that. So with that, I thank you for your, for your attention, and I'm open for questions. So uh, thanks a lot, Marcus. That was a very nice overview of how we are slowly going to classical from quantum. So we saw this increase in the size as we went along in your talk. So thanks a lot. So we already have some questions in the chat box. So what I'll do is I'll read the question and maybe, thanks, yes. you know, because it's not quite getting recorded, right? The chat box. So uh, the first question is from Anindo Sinha. Uh, does the impressive control with big molecules shed light on the issue of the Heisenberg cut? Um, you mean a cut between the quantum and the classical world? Um, because I, I would con consider that a Bohr's cut. <laughs> but, uh, so if, if that's what you mean, then uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say because there's no cut. Huh? Um, I'm not sure if, if there's really any, any clear cut. It's, it's the experimentalist who, who decides what's happening, so to say. Um, the question is, well, if, if there were an objective collapse of the wave function, for instance, at a given mass, um, as Girardi and friends believed, um, then that would certainly say something about it. Um, but maybe the experiments will kind of disprove, not at least exclude it to a certain, certain limit until it loses meaning to talk about this. So um, in, in that sense, yes. But um, it might as well be that there's a cut <laughs> at a kilogram and we will never do a kilogram interference experiment. Um. Okay, so we move on to the next question from Apura Patel. Uh, when a large molecule has multiple conformations uh, due to tunneling, is that treated as a superposition? Oh, that is a very intriguing question because um, I think there will be a paper coming up uh, by Ben Stickler and friends uh, who are suggesting that you might do a quantum interference experiment where the molecule is also in a superposition of conformations. Currently in our experiments, they're not. They're just in many, many, many conformations, each molecule in a different one, but they're not yet individually in different conformations. And, but if you could do that, that would really be intriguing. And you could conceive experiments where you entangled kind of the internal state with external states. Um, so, but not yet. Mm -hmm. So we move on to the next question from Deepankar Home. Uh, please comment on the figure of merit of macroscopicity for your experiment to compare with the non-interferometric tests, putting bounds on CSL modifications of quantum mechanics. Yeah, so yeah, that is an interesting question also because, well, what, what so the, the term macroscopy, or the, the measure for macroscopicity, uh, um, briefly go back to that slide. Okay. Uh, it just takes a while while I'm talking, but um, so here it is. Stefan Imrich and Klaus Hauenberger introduce a measure for, for macroscopicity, which is a very specific measure to test which experiment can exclude um, small deviations from the Schrödinger equation, small ad hoc additions, nonlinear additions, um, collapse terms, so to say. Um, which experiment can exclude that best, so to say. <clears throat> they introduced this <coughs> measure of macroscopicity, which is shown here in the upper right, which depends on, in, in our case here, on the, <clears throat> on the mass of the object divided by the electron mass, the coherence time that you can maintain in, in units of seconds, and the contrast of your quantum experiment um, normalized to the theory, to your expectation. And so this allows you to compare different quantum experiments, but it does not allow you to compare non-quantum experiments. And so this is a philosophical thing somehow. You could say, and, and many people do say, you can test and test the presence or absence of modifications to quantum mechanics, because if they existed, also using non-quantum non experiments, just classical experiments, you could also test that using uh, observations of ultra cold atoms, ultra cold electrons, cantilevers, uh, or the absence of X ray radiation in, 
in semiconductors, because all that would, would come, come about if collapse were there. Collapse would shrink the wave function ever, ever now and then, every now and then, and then it would actually increase the kinetic energy, so that's heating, or it would even generate X-ray radiation. So the absence of that heating or the absence of radiation is also an indication for the absence of this term. Just philosophically, um, I personally always prefer to do a quantum experiment to, do, to test quantum mechanics um, because the other tests need more hypotheses in addition. But in, in terms of testing these GRW parameters, I think, to my knowledge at the moment, the best test is uh, Catalina Cochano's experiments in Kansasso and Frascati, where they <clears throat> don't see X-ray radiation coming out of a lump of solids, so to say, which would be expected if this phenomenon existed. Um, but it's always a little bit harder to see nothing, so to say. I mean, if everything's done well, and I trust she, she's done everything well, then I, I think it's valid to argue the way she does. Um, I personally would prefer to see quantum mechanics to fail at some point instead of not seeing a phenomenon that we may not even expect. But it's it's a philosophical difference, so to say. Okay, can I oh, yeah. just yeah. ask yes, you can a bit on that point? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, in your 2019 paper, Nature Physics paper, it was then you suggest that you go to a next generation of your experiments. You can provide more uh, constraints comparable to the non interferometric bounds by going to an order of magnitude higher so that you can provide more robust limits on the Adler range of parameters for the CSL models. So yeah. that is the Especially remark you had made. So what kind of progress, because in your last part of the talk, you did not mention about the possibility of this next generation of experiments along that line. So what yeah. kind of improvements are needed for that line or so, in order so, of magnitude? Which so is it, the same. The, the, yeah. yeah, sorry. The, the yes. single order of magnitude mass increase would, of course, shift things and it would allow to exclude a very specific model by Adler, uh, mm. which was uh, with here. So there, mm. the next order of magnitude um, would, would be able to exclude Adler's uncertainty, so to say here. Mm. But if you want to exclude, uh, at least get to the point where Gerardi Rimni Weber made their hypotheses, um, I think we would really need to go to the end of what's possible currently foreseeably in a, in a medium-sized tower, 10 to the 8 mass units or so. Um, but that is actually also the plan that we get there. And we're not the only ones. 10 to the power 8. 10 yes. to the power 8 atomic. Well, well, actually, I had a discussion when Gerard was still alive with him. He came twice okay. to Vienna. And the first, okay. first time he came, he said, if you can show it for 10 to the 9, I will give up my theory. And next time he said, if you get to 10 to the 16, I will give up, give up my theory. So that shows also that there's a certain flexibility in the theoretical approach, um, yeah, yes. but it, it just doesn't make too much sense anymore if um, if the mass is is too big, so to say, because we yeah then it doesn't explain much. So so at least to next order of magnitude, you are hopeful of going to the next generation of experiments. Uh, um, the metal clusters should certainly give another order of magnitude, probably magnitude. two. Oh, two. Okay. And, and that will provide more constraints. Definitely. Yes, that's that's the plan. We are working on it. And um, and as you may have seen, there was also a comment in Nature now by uh, well, there were many people on it, but also Angelo Bassi, Henrik Ulbricht, uh, Mauro Paternostro, where, where they said it needs a billion, I don't know whether it was dollars or euros, but that doesn't make a difference on that scale, um, to do an experiment in space, which is actually what Rainer Kaltenberg and friends had proposed in Marco since 10 years or so. Um, and probably in the beginning, they asked only for half a billion. <laughs> but in the end, they want yes. a larger consortium is really going to, um, to that space idea, which is interesting, but super expensive. And you should really be sure on the ground that there's no problem until 10 to the 8 before you do a billion dollar experiment with 10 to the 10 in space. And you are happy with the way the collision and thermal decoherence has been handled in your experiment, because the remark made on, in your paper has been that it plays so far a not significant role in reducing the observed visibility because of the vacuum pressure and molecular yes, temperature yes. you have achieved. 
So okay. how could they maintain it even if you go an order of magnitude higher? For, for the next order of magnitude, that's still okay. So magnitude, we've just bought, yes. we've just bought new pumps. Okay. So uh, I think we will also oh, reach so the next that order. should be okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but it, it really becomes okay, a problem for, for higher masses. And, okay, thank you. So, so we go on to the next question, Marcus, from Joseph Samuel. Uh, what is the kind of fringe visibility that uh, one has achieved in these experiments? Um, typically, 30% is the best. Um, that's, that's not because 100% is um, the theory mark and unachievable. 30% is also the theory expectation. And that has to do with the fact that we have a velocity distribution and um, that um, the grating is a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal um, grating, so to say. So we, we hit the theoretical mark, but it's 30%. Okay, and also has this been done for any ionized molecules? Again, this is a, a question of historic importance in the sense that so many people have tried to do ion interferometry. And of course you can do it with electrons. You do it in electron microscopy every day. Um, protons, very difficult. Um, and there was a single experiment by Franz Hasselbach in Tübingen where he showed fringes with helium plus and well he himself never dared to we published it but never high level because he was a bit uncertain i think he was he had good results but still um many groups try to start with argon plus with neon as a nitrogen plus with even protons again antiprotons was a discussion and they all stopped because the interaction with the environment is so much stronger than the diffraction effects that it's very hard to shield stray fields. But with positrons, it has also been seen, but the positron is as light as the electron, so the times are right. different. Right. Uh, so we have a question from Arun Pati. Have you seen any deviation from the wave particle duality in experiment? What is your view on the question that quantum entity may not be either wave or particle, but maybe something else? So, good question again. Um, yeah, so far there was no, serious deviation from the wave particle duality. Everything fit so far with the theory expectations. Of course, always with some error bars. We're doing experiments, so there's always an error bar. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I remember that when we had uh, the first 1600 mass unit interference, um, a colleague in the US oh yeah, from, from Scotland came and said, um, well, there's a 5% deviation, so that must already be an indication of space-time fluctuations. That was probably a little bit daring. Huh? And I told him, well, there's also experimental uncertainties, and that could be cleared later. But um, <clears throat> so far, yeah, it's all within the theory, but it's getting harder to control decoherence, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, whether the particle is something else, <laughs> And that is very philosophical. I don't have a good interpretation of quantum mechanics. If I had, I would be a famous man. Um, so I, I usually yeah. tend to say that I'm agnostic, but I actually am pr probably more eclectic in the sense that depending on the day and the experiment, I change my interpretation. Sure. Because sometimes you, you can really work very well with De Broglie Bohm's experimental uh, approach. On other days, it's much more natural to be a Copenhagenist. It's, You're it's... just more practical, I would say, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but I, I never vote for many worlds. That's... <laughs> sure, that is, uh, that is a common uh, choice, right? Not to vote for many worlds, perhaps. But so I think we have run out. So we don't have any further questions in the chat window. So if anyone wants to unmute and ask anything, then kindly feel free to do that. Uh, I have a comment, please, if this yes. is the end, since you have well, started by observing that this is the Schrodinger anniversary. Uh, one of the applications you mentioned, Professor Arndt, in a very nice, uh, beautiful experiments, very nice talk. Uh, one of them was that you could measure accurately static polarizabilities of atoms and molecules. So my comment is that Schrodinger invented the word quantum defect which uh, I think is well known uh, mm -hmm. among atomic and molecular uh, physicists. And uh, it was in a 1921 paper, even before his famous quantum mechanics papers. And he had a very sophisticated already interpretation of the quantum defects of the alkalis and the polarizabilities. So I thought yeah. that's, that's a connection to your talk. Okay, thanks. 
Mm -hmm. So, so, so Rukashi, if I can just one yeah, please go quick, ahead. quick comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so about um, your this robustness of your test with this two four more large class of CSL model, you remark in your paper uh, about the possibility of putting more constraints on modified CSL with color, noise, and dissipation. Uh, by going to the next run of experiments so have you done uh, more studies in that respect no uh, no theory study comment uh, uh, the, um no, yeah, no I, 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 I can't you, that remark is there in your paper yeah, yeah. um <laughs> that to, to, to be honest next generation of experiments okay. yeah. yeah so yes. it, it will yeah. it will certainly push the boundaries but um so the, the colored noise is really a thing because um, so in um, in your so I'm, paper I'm sure when that making that remark you make a reference to Gasperi and Yellow Bassi paper yeah, yeah, some yeah, paper in physics letters of yeah, yeah, 2017 that's, a, that's, that's true um, mm, but so probably the remark was sneaked in by by one of our juniors but ne nevertheless um, there's so we will not be able to distinguish okay. the different models clearly. We'll just push okay. the boundaries as they are on that diagram. Okay. Um, but the noise is an issue also in the in the non-interferometric experiments because you can. How should I say that? Um, mm -hmm. So the the question is, what should induce this collapse? This must be a field from the outside and. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what that field really is, but if it's okay. a field, if if the temperature of that field is just the temperature of the quantum system, it will not induce. Okay. Um, you you will what was it? Um, it will still induce noise. collapse, but it will not but induce. It would, would not induce heat. Yeah. 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 So um, there, there, there are systems where you can say, well, an interference experiment would be scrambled, but in heating, you wouldn't see anything. That, that, I think that was the statement that we wanted to make. Okay, okay. okay. So it's a bit intrigued by that comment. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. So I don't know if there are any further comments. So Marcus, all this is basically about trying to, I mean, you know, just to summarize in my mind. So essentially we are increasing the size of the quantum system and trying to see uh, if it still remains quantum. And so at some point we would fail. Is that how this is sort of envisaged? Um, well, yeah. That, so the question is, would it fail at would all? Would it fail? Did it Did, what is your uh, expectation of that? <clears throat> and, um, well, as you know, there's a bunch of people proposing that, well, if it fails, it might be due to gravity. And if it does not fail, it might show that um, gravity is quantum. Mm -hmm. So either way you win, so to say, either way you, so either you, you find that quantum mechanics is kind of modified in its linearity by, by gravity, which Roger Penrose would believe, or Diyoshi would believe, um, or you believe like, Gamaletto and Vladko Vedral and Zugato Bose and friends, um, that if you can get to 10 to the 14 mass units, which is huge and very far out, huh? um, that if you have two superposed systems um, interacting with each other, then gravity would entangle them. Then, then you would see the quantumness of gravity in that sense. Um, so, either way, if you can get to these high masses, you expect to see something, mm -hmm. um, but we don't know what. So, I think Simon Raj has raised hand. Simon Raj? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was. I guess I'm. I'm a little confused about what size of a particle here means. Does it mean that it's even like heavy, or is it like it has more extent in space, or is it that there are more number of particles? Which, um, which, yeah. all, all of that may be interesting to study independently. Um, mass is what people are interested in if they're thinking about gravitational collapse and interaction with different particles. Um, size is an experimental um, constraint uh, because the, if the particle becomes comparable in size with the grating period, you get tidal effects which make things interesting, let's say. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's different. The different size, complexity, and mass have different effects on the experiment. And all yeah, of them. Are the yeah, the outrageous example in my head 
which I had was, you know, what would happen if I throw a single black hole through a grating? It's very heavy, but it's a single particle, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's that's... not about numbers and definitely because, nice. I, yeah, because I always thought that you know, microscopic effects happen because there are too many particles and they behave in a strange way and then you get this. Ah. Uh, now you would also expect something as a function of mass. So if you can provide a black hole, I will do the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would, would be really intriguing, but difficult. <laughs> So what That's you're saying is that all three have ramifications in different types of experiments. So mass is one thing, number of particles is one thing, and then perhaps size or the extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yes. and the good thing is we can vary that. In the metal right. cluster experiments, for instance, you just take metals of different density or silicon compared to gold or so. There's a factor of 10 different density. And um, that, that's in principle the goal of this universal interferometry. But the distance scale over which interference is so that is also a macroscopicity parameter, no? Like the neutron, yeah. e, you know, the neutron oh, yeah, of flavor oscillations over 700 kilometers. No, that yeah, is yeah. also so, by yeah, some yeah. figure of merit. Definitely. So we, we often have discussions, what is a good measure for macroscopicity? And actually, you yes. can come up with a list of 10 or 15 yeah. different <laughs> measures. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's, it's true. Distance is also important. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, uh, perhaps we'll take one last question and it's from Usha Devi. Uh, is it possible to contrast between the rate of collapse of wave function with the rate of decoherence in your experiments? Um, I would even add the rate of uh, loss of contrast because of dark matter. Okay. So um, um, all these things are very hard to distinguish because many of them scale with M squared. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to study your system very much in detail and then it's good that one can also change the materials, the couplings to the environment. So if it's um, for, um, if it depends on the number of particles or on the mass, if it's collapse rate as a number of particles or, number or, or the mass, that would be different from decoherence uh, because of collision and decoherence or thermal decoherence if you can vary between gold and silicon for instance. So one would have to do many experiments with many different particles to be really sure. And that's why I'm happy that we have this rather universal approach. Um, currently, we can really cho choose between many different materials and uh, relatively easy, easily switch. Even more easily in the next generation, I would say, because um, okay. that's the interesting part. The, the bigger the systems become, the easier the laser systems become. Mm -hmm. As uh, you mentioned during your talk, that uh, it is uh, often if you find collapse, often then coherence is lost. That's the way of connecting the two. If that is the way of connecting the two, are there any independent ways of checking coherence and rate of collapse? That's why I asked yeah. this question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's only briefly alluded to. So if collapse occurred, this would also just heat the system. It would increase kinetic energy. And the argument for that is that um, a shrinking of the wave function um, is equivalent to increasing the kinetic energy because the kinetic energy in quantum mechanics is kind of the second derivative. It's the curvature of the wave function. So if that increases, the kinetic energy increases. So that's these heating experiments um, which are being pursued in I met several places, um, so with Hendrik Ulbricht and Angelo Bassi and uh, Catalina Cochano and, and others. And <clears throat> so, yes, one can search for the heating. Um, coherence can also be lost by mere dephasing or phase averaging. And that is a very important effect on the ground. Um, the fact that we're sitting on Earth and that Earth is rotating and gravitating, um, that makes that even if the, the experiment is tilted ever so slightly by a few micro radians or so, if the two arms are on picometer different heights in the gravitational field, this shifts the interference phase. And this does this as a function of velocity. So um, actually, this is a big fight in all these experiments to reduce non-decoherence fringe loss. <laughs> Um, so fr fringe loss for me is the entanglement with the environment and to distill that from all the other effects, that's quite a bit of work. Thank you. Thanks, Usha. So I think we are uh, good for now, uh, Marcus. So sorry, it took a little longer than maybe what you anticipated, but I think the discussion turned out really interesting. So thanks a lot for uh, once again for the colloquium. And uh, so... 
Thanks, thanks for being yeah, with bye. you and it was a pleasure to see you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So there's a clap bye. from Ravi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, see you. Yeah. See you. Bye.